Yes, recording Great. is started. Great, I see that. Thank you. OK, so yeah, I just want to welcome all of our members and maybe some guests this week. Um, since it's a little you know, impersonal online, I'd like to make it a bit more personal and thought maybe we could all use the chat feature to maybe share, um, yeah, just wh where we're calling in from and what company or, or position we're with. Um, I think it might also be good context uh, for us once we get to the, you know, the actual program part of the meeting. So yeah, if, if you can type that in as we, we go through the next slides, yeah, I think it'd be nice for us all to see who's here. Um, all right, so next slide, please. And then I would introduce, yes, that I'm Scott Terrigan um, and I'm with US Army Europe and Africa. I'm a civil engineer in their protection office and the current post president. All right, um, so with today's meeting, as always, please keep your camera and microphone off. Uh, until yeah, it's it's your time to speak or you have a question in the in that up session. Um, our meeting is recorded, so be aware of that. And yeah, it's posted later uh, to our website so that people can view and reference later for the key details we share. Next slide, please. All right, this is our current um, officers of the last year. Uh, I'd ask that you please just maybe look over on the left hand column at some of those positions. And yeah, so these we've all been serving in this in the, in the past year in these capacities, um, but the year's almost done and yeah, we'll need to soon fill them for the next year. Some of us will are happy to serve again. Um, yeah, but we'd also maybe appreciate help in some of these roles. So if there's something that you have a good connection to or interest in, uh, we'd appreciate uh, if you could contact me and let me know if you're interested come January in, in serving in a role or, or helping as you know uh, with a role. Um, for example, if you have children in the school system, you probably have much better connection to uh, STEM than than myself uh, or, or some other some others. So you can at least you know facilitate some of the events uh, that we'd like to host uh, or, or have uh, since you naturally have some connections to the schools and the children. Um, also, we have a new website, which we'll hear about later. So if you're interested in, if you have skills in it already, or you're interested in, you know, kind of developing some skills, um, it's a good opportunity since there's a lot of training resources for us to build our website. Um, yeah, we definitely appreciate help there. Uh, so yeah, please contact me if you're interested in, in helping out for the year ahead, starting in January. Next slide, please. Uh, I'll now turn this over to Tim to talk about the program. Thanks, Scott. So we are heading into the last quarter of FY23, or sorry, CY23. And, um, and we have some proposed programs coming up, especially, so we have, obviously we have STEM TED Talk today. We're looking at doing a value added tax uh, discussion, panel discussion with the Corps of Engineers. In October, that has yet to be confirmed. We have a couple of experts there at the Corps of Engineers on the who organize the uh, defense cooperation agreements between countries, and I'm hoping to get them to speak uh, in October. And they they said they're considering it, so that it may be a quick switch out. But we are we're waiting for confirmation on that one. And then we do have confirmed our cyber resiliency. Uh, talk from, I believe that's Stan Tech who will be giving that talk as well. Um, we'll have our holiday social in, in December. And then uh, I put this on the event schedule just to get it on people's calendars that I would like to repeat the government program event we had last year in January. And so just want to kind of put it out there. Again, it has to be uh, confirmed, but uh, want to put it in people's uh, calendars just to make sure uh, if we can repeat the great program we had last year with 110 people, that would be amazing. So that's what I've got. Scott, back to you. Great. Thank you. Next slide, please. I'm not sure if Chris was able to join us. Um, but if not, that's all right. I'll cover these. Um, so yeah, Chris is our VP for membership. So um, he has a few slides on changes from from the last month. So at the moment, we have six new members, uh, bringing us to 208, um, specifically for the Rhine Mine Post. And then a 
few key people to note is uh, Mike Telema. He's with Odosenge, uh, so in the same building as myself. He's the environmental chief. He's been to a few of our meetings. Um, yeah, I guess he's seen the value and interested to get you know more, more involved. Um, and then we have two new sustaining members, which we'll see on the next slide. Um, companies, and then these are the members from those companies that have joined as part of it. So welcome to all, and yeah, please reach out to us and let us know, you know, what you hope to get from the, the organization, how how we can add value to you. Next slide, please. So these are the two groups: the sustaining members, Sedge Group, and Black Security Products. Next slide, please. And here are all our sustaining members. Um, so yeah, thank you for your continued support. Um, it's yeah, you know, the the I guess the membership dues that are paid for this support you know the post functions that we host throughout the year um we'll hear about a one we just had last week next slide please okay so i don't think nick is online nick Irwin. um but so i'll cover this i'll cover the fun thing first at the bottom so yeah last week he hosted a yeah young professional hosted mixer so it was open to all but kind of hosted by the young professionals that kind of was the big turnout and maybe the focus of the attraction um we just did it in downtown Wiesbaden at a venue and uh, we provided a, a round or two um of drinks and, and some shared some shared snacks uh, we had a good turnout it was yeah over, over 25 people um and about half were Oda Senge and half were uh, the USACE staff. Um, so myself, it was good. I got to meet um, quite a few new people, especially uh, in USACE, um, and get to know some other people more. Um, and we all did a good job of kind of mixing around and and yeah, getting to know those people that we're working on projects with or have shared interests with. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a nice evening, and we hope to have some more again soon. And then just on the more business side of the young professionals uh, and what Nick manages is, yeah, he likes to put out that the SAME has a leadership development program that's going to be opening up in mid-October for application. So, yeah, if there's someone in your organization or yourself that's interested, yeah, we'd, we'd like to, to nominate our post. We'd like to nominate them for it. So please contact Nick. His email's at the bottom. Um, otherwise, just some opportunities that are out there, especially for the, some of the government members calling in is... Um, credentialing, so those are PE licenses and stuff have opportunities to be paid for. Um, PMP certification, the government has an opportunity for paying for training and certification. Um, and just, you know, once you have these credentials, there's opportunities uh, to watch webinars, to maintain your PDHs, or to just get more involved with like the SAME national community of interest for, for young professionals and, and give back a bit to the others. Next slide, please. Okay, I'll turn this over to Britta. All right, let me share my lovely mug here. All right, um, I shared a little bit of this um, at the last meeting, but just wanted to uh, reiterate what the focus is on uh, for the remainder of this year. Uh, working with um, working on outreach with the Department of Defense Schools. I keep wanting to say Dodds. I know it's Dodia now, um, but showing my age. Uh, but working with the different schools, both in Wiesbaden and Stuttgart, I was able to make some uh, points of contact uh, last year uh, through the STEM application process. So I'm working to um, identify uh, through them some opportunities uh, for the post to support their STEM programs over the next year, and also to make sure that the word gets out on the STEM scholarship schedule. Um, unfortunately, we only had four people apply for the uh, for the scholarship last year, and I'm hoping we can get those numbers up this year. But you know, the candidates we did have and, and our three uh, recipients were definitely um, top notch. So that was good to see. Um, I am going to be working with the STEM scholarship recipients. Um, two of them are just starting school, I think this week, one last week, one this week, and then the other one started in, <clears throat> excuse me, late July. So um, my, my focus is going to be on making sure that they're signed up for their STEM student membership, but also to make them aware that there are mentoring opportunities available uh, through the communities of interest uh, programs, um, if, if they're interested in pursuing that, but also to see if I can coordinate with them to provide us an update on how their first year um, of, of studies went. So I'm looking for that update maybe in the May timeframe, uh, not too late, 
might have to be April because I, I know some of them do get out of school in May. So I'll keep everyone posted on that. Um, I reviewed the 2023 application. Um, I think it was a fairly good application. We took some best practices from other posts and incorporated it in the updates that we made last year. Um, and so I think the only thing it needs at this point is just changing 2023 to 2024. Um, and then uh, updating the schedule for that process. So I'll get that done over the next month or so. Um, and if you have any questions or any recommendations um, about our coordination efforts with the schools and so forth, um, or about the scholarship process, please feel, re feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'm always looking for suggestions and definitely help. So thank you. Thank you, Britta. I really like this 90-day uh, focus to, to see you know, the steps of the way ahead. Um, but what I really like is, yeah, this new effort from our post now that you have interest to do to keep in touch with our previous scholarship recipients. For sure, um, it, it's nice to, to get a scholarship and, and help with some of those initial costs. Um, but I think that's really where the value can come is keeping them engaged and, and giving them access to people you know have been are involved in the real practicing community or have been involved for a long time. And yeah, that's positive influences or, or, or mentors for them. So I think a lot of good can come from that. So thanks for the effort and yeah, I look forward to yeah, hear, hearing from them um, or seeing where we can continue to help them. Next slide, please. Okay, so Chandler um, is normally the one that's uh, you know, handling these topics and you know him from the emails that, that he sends you about once or twice a month. Um, I'm going to cover his content today, um, but first of all, yeah, when you hear from once or twice a month, it's a news flash. So if you are a member, you will, you know, your your email is with us, and we will send you the news flash automatically. So that's how you find out about our our next meetings, um, or, or any kind of key key information. Um, otherwise, you can manually pull it from our websites. Um, yes, two websites now. Uh, so the top one is the one we've been using, and you're all familiar with. Um, but yeah, that is sunsetting now that National has made us a new platform and website, which we are just starting to build now. Um, so at the moment, we have two, but there's no information on the new one yet, but we're actively soon working to, to transition to that. So in the meantime, please check both and we'll let you know uh, once we've kind of made the full transition. Um, but on the old one, as you may know, is a yeah, library of all our previous presentations. So yeah, the slides, um, but also the recordings of, of these events. Uh, so you can rewatch, or if you have a new staff member um, that's not familiar with structural proofing or, or fire code in Germany, uh, you can use that as a you know quick training tool for them, at least to you know, learn some basics. Um, so yeah, you can find them from our website, but then also at our YouTube channel there, which is where they're actually hosted. Um, all right, next slide, please. Okay, so then I think we're right on time to now transition this over to uh, Tim for today's program. Okay, I'll introduce Britta as she lines up the presentation. Firstly, as you just saw, uh, Britta is our Vice President of Scholarships, Education and STEM, which is why she is leading our discussion today on STEM. Uh, I just want to thank Britta in advance for taking on this presentation and an event for this month. Uh, it is, it's a difficult time of year to present for anybody in our industry which is slightly reflective in the amount of people that we have on this call today. At the same time, this topic is a streamer award, so it's really important for our organization to, to present and discuss and have events on this topic. So thank you, uh, Britta, for, for taking that over and taking on that responsibility. I would also mention uh, Britta is with Stantex. She is a certified AICP and a PMP also the general manager of Stantec in Germany, and she also leads master planning for Stantec. She is a master planning lead. Uh, we're really fortunate to have her today and, and leading this discussion. So thank you, Britta, and over to you. Well, well thank you, Tim, and, and good afternoon, everyone. I think looking at the chat box, it looks like everyone is in Europe, so I don't need to say good morning to anyone over on the East Coast. 
Um, welcome to this year's STEM session. Um, I want to start out by saying that I know for some this is not the most exciting topic um, or perhaps the most uh, relevant, especially if you don't have any children or grandchildren around to, to influence and support. Uh, but as Tim said, it is very important to the post uh, for a number of different reasons, including the fact that goal number four of the SAME strategic plan is to enrich the STEM pipeline for the nation. So what I have done is um, I've set this uh, presentation up. I'm actually not doing the TED talk. I didn't want to bore you with, with watching me uh, give a speech on something I'm definitely not an expert in, uh, but I have set it up in such a way to share several, um, what I found very interesting, enlightening, uh, TED Talks um, that I think will really um, uh, relay how, um, you know, we can support STEM, um, promote and support um, pathways to STEM degrees and STEM careers um, in our region. Um, and so it's, it's a reminder of how important it is and how as we as individuals and a post uh, can be involved um, in this in this movement. So um, let me get started here. Just as a quick reminder, uh, STEM is an educational approach that teaches science, technology, engineering, and mathematics in an applied and interdisciplinary manner. And STEM education helps kids to think creatively, ask questions, be innovative, connect the dots, and solve problems. So why is it important? Well, the Challenger Center for Space Science Education, um, a not-for-profit education organization that was founded in honor of the Challenger crew, uh, recently stated that STEM occupations are projected to grow over two times faster than the total for all other occupations over the next 10 years. And in 2023, the Bureau of Labor Statistics showed that employment for STEM occupations between 20 and 20 2022 and 2032 are actually projected to increase by 10.8%, while most other occupations are projected to grow at just 4% during the same period. At the same time, the Department of Defense predicts that 80% of all jobs in the future, now and into the future, will require STEM skills during the next decade. This projection is especially important to a department that employs the majority of STEM professionals in the federal government. I was actually surprised to learn that the DOD has over 60,000 STEM professionals that are working in over 200 Department of Defense laboratories and centers. So just out of curiosity, using the chat feature, uh, can anyone um, online identify a DOD supported innovation? Anyone, anyone? Think major inventions uh, Teflon. Teflon. in the kitchen. Teflon. Ah, there you go, Scott. There you go, the, the, the internet, GPS, absolutely. I think Brian's typing something. What else have we got out there? The microwave, yes, Brian, thank you. So um, I was fascinated to go through the list of DOD supported and in innovation um, inventions. Uh, it includes the microwave, duct tape, which I don't know about you, but I love duct tape, <laughs> works for everything. The EpiPen, uh, that's a big one, super glue, and the digital camera. And then of course the DOD funded and supported uh, various projects that created your cell phone, which includes GPS, um, as uh, Scott indicated, Siri, multi-touch screen, and the microprocessor. And I see somebody else in there, Tim Thru and Teflon. Yes, those are all correct. So um, didn't know that, uh, very fascinated by that. So those 200 STEM laboratories and centers, uh, they're definitely supporting um, a lot of innovation, a lot of creativity. So that's pretty fun to see. All right, let's go on to the next one. Um, looking back at the STEM programs and, and how it came about, uh, studies show that proficiency in STEM 
is really vital to generating economic growth and it's advancing scientific innovation and creating jobs. So graduates of STEM programs play a vital role in making the United States more competitive in the global economy. And STEM education is also the foundation of a more secure nation. While various STEM predecessors have been around for a while, it really wasn't until the early 2000s that STEM became a critical component of education programs across the country. So at the time, several studies showed that U.S. students were not achieving in the STEM disciplines at the same rate as students in other countries. Of course, that was very worrisome. And since then, there's been a much greater emphasis on these fields, as well as a continuous push for improving the quality of the curricula and instruction within U.S. schools, including the Department of Defense um, education system. While there are quite a few goals for integrated STEM education, one of the key goals is to develop a STEM capable workforce. STEM jobs are in high demand, but the pool of qualified candidates is small. And if the projections hold true that I shared with you on the previous slide, the demand is going to continue to grow and we're going to have a lot of gaps um, in our workforce. Um, in 2022, the National Science Board released an indicator paper that showed the average math and science scores for the United States are lackluster and stagnant. That is the headline on their white paper summary, lackluster and stagnant. Among the largest science and engineering competitors, which includes the G7, our G7 partners, Korea and China, the U.S. is actually ranked last. That's pretty um, disturbing. Countries around the world are gaining on the United States as their students continue to outperform our students year after year. And finally, they found that the COVID-19 pandemic caused a huge disruption to the U.S. education system that set us even further back um, in, in the indicators. So a lot going on there, some things to keep in mind, and hopefully we'll um, further uh, emphasize why it's so important for us to support STEM um, as an organization, but as well as individuals. So I've decided, as I said, not to bore you with an hour of me spouting statistics and forecasts at you. Instead, I'm gonna share a couple of TEDx talks uh, that I believe really hit home the importance of STEM education in our schools. I have two short vid videos to show you. Uh, one is just under 15 minutes, the other is about 12 minutes, and then I'll wrap it up with a few pointers and a couple of questions for you. So the first video is um, from National Teacher of the Year finalist Rob Stevenson. And in this video uh, titled Developing 21st Century Problem Solvers, Rob explains why STEM education needs to be part of every child's learning experience, not just at school, but at home and within our communities, and why we as a nation need to reframe our thinking when it comes to failure. So let me click on this and hope this works. Maybe, possibly. Um, give me a second. I might have to do this a different way. I was set up to do this. Okay, here we go. And go. Uh, Britta, we can't hear it, I don't think. We don't have audio on this. I've had this happen before on other people presenting when they do. I don't know if anybody has. So nobody can hear it? No, unfortunately. Oh, no. Oh, no. How do anybody I fix know? that? Yeah, does anybody have a quick fix for that? I know there's various ways to present in Teams. And I know we've had this problem even within my company when people share videos, but somehow they're able to fix it. Anybody online have a suggestion? Various ways to present? Maybe someone has a smarter way to just present it, but if not, I'll give a workaround. You could just share the link in the chat and we could all click it on three, two, one, go. Okay. <laughs> Let me... but, but let's see if someone has a smarter idea. 
All right, let me get the link. Well, that really sucks. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry about that, Bruta. Yeah, the. Uh, All right, let me put that in the chat box then. Um, and we'll do Are it you three, presenting two, maybe Uta from PowerPoint Live as well? I don't know. See your no. Oh, no, that's yeah. Okay. Excel Live, Browse Live. All right, well, there is the YouTube link. Yeah. Britta, it looks like Jessica shared a screenshot. Click on the tab in there. Not okay, sure so, if it works. I just Googled it. OK, so what do I do? I play the video during the presence. So, so stop close. sharing my slide. Click OK, stop sharing. And then what do I do? Click the tab in your browser for the video. OK. And then open that. the sharing dialogue in Teams. OK. And first check the box at the top left to share the system audio. OK. Let's try that. All right. And then share. Correct. Open the sharing dialogue in Teams. I don't know what that means. And first check the box in the top left to share the system audio. I don't know exactly what that means. I don't know what the sharing I, dialogue is. I know what is. that means. It's it's oh. once you when you do go to share a screen or something, um there's an, uh, just a, uh, an option like before. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Window yeah. Or the, or the Include computer sound. Yep. Where is it? Do you it? see that? Do you see that? Ah, yep. yes. OK, got it. Thank you. I just learned something new. Well, let's so see now let me <laughs> let me try to share. Let's see if this works. All right. Can you guys hear it? Give it a second. Not yet. For those of you that aren't familiar yes, with STEM, it the works. Okay. Science, yes, I can hear. Technology, Yay. engineering, and math. And in my 20 years in education, I have seen kids become the most perseverant problem solvers just using STEM education in the classroom. But first, before I jump in, I think it's time to reflect for just a minute. I want you to think about some of our greatest visionaries. And I want you to think about the contributions that they have made and consider what our world would be like if they hadn't made those contributions. It's interesting, but it would probably be a lot darker than it is right now. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. And I can also say thank you to Thomas Edison, among others. Um, Thomas Edison was once asked by a reporter, Mr. Edison, how could you have continued to work on trying to develop the electric light bulb after you had failed a thousand times? And Edison's response was rather poignant. He said, sir, I did not fail once. I found a thousand ways that did not work. Really sort of reframes your thinking about failure, doesn't it? Edison didn't believe in failure. He believed in perseverance. Now, what would happen if Thomas Edison were in school today. Tommy's got his science homework and he brings it back into school. Now, would he be given an F because that assignment was so late? Or would he be given an A for his perseverance? It really comes back to what we value. Great thinkers in science, technology, engineering, and math, they value certain qualities, that of continually being curious, and the ability to persist when challenges get tough. Albert Einstein has a wonderful quote. He said, it's not that I'm smart, it's just that I stay with problems longer. When I think about kids in school today, they have that same potential, but do we give them the opportunity to stay with problems longer? The way school 
schools are often structured, we focus a great deal on product rather than on process. We teach a certain number of minutes in dedicated content. We teach them procedures. We teach them to strive for that right answer. And if they're successful, they get good grades. I mean, raise your hand if you can identify with that model of teaching. I know I can. Thank you. That is until I got into college in my education program. And I met an amazing man who sort of transformed my thinking in learning and teaching. I have a, a canning jar here. If you're not familiar with a canning jar, the old canning jars that your grandmothers used to use to can vegetables and whatnot, there's a two-part metal lid that goes into a canning jar. And what I did is I took out the metal insert and I replaced it with a window screen. So that screen is porous. And so of course I can pour this green water right through there and you turn it over and of course water comes out. The interesting thing when you have a teacher like Dr. David Keller, he shows you how you can do something absolutely astounding and make people really wonder. Now you've seen this water come out repeatedly. It pours out, it's porous. Now that's pretty fascinating. Clearly I could walk into a classroom and do that and tell the students what we're gonna talk about on that given day, but that's not what he modeled for us. He modeled for us setting up a problem that was pretty dynamic and engaging and then empowering us to figure out how did that work? Through ex exploration and problem solving, we figured that out. Well, you can imagine with that sort of a model as my science methods instructor in college, I was pretty pumped about teaching science when I got my first classroom. And I quickly engaged the kids with hands-on experiences just like this and taught the kids how to problem solve and they really understood high level content. In 2007, I was awarded with the Presidential Award in Excellence in Science Teaching, and I was invited to Washington, D.C., and for the first time in my career, I heard about STEM education. I'd never heard of it before. And before I left, I was so inspired, I remember driving back from Washington, D.C., and telling my wife, oh my gosh, I have to do this in my classroom, thinking about focusing on process and, and giving projects to the kids where they really could grapple with problems even longer. So as we're driving back, I'm brainstorming, and we start contacting different organizations when I returned to Michigan and I started collecting projects to do. And my wife and I started collecting every recyclable object you can think of, not knowing what students would want to use in their prototypes. So years ago, my first endeavor in STEM education in my classroom, I decided I was going to do an extension of the current electricity unit that I had just finished with my third graders. And my plan is, my students were going to be electrical engineers. I'm gonna give them these blank blueprints. They're gonna draft these wiring diagrams. They're going to wire these little miniature houses with lights and motorized ceiling fans and switches. And then I would come in as the electrical inspector and I'm gonna inspect their work. And if they did a nice job, if the wiring diagram is accurate, if the house is safe, they earn their electrical permit. It's a great idea. So I pass out these blueprints and I'm walking around and the kids are very excited and they're filling in their blueprints and suddenly I got this sick feeling in my stomach realizing that none of these plans, not one of them, not one of them was gonna work. And I didn't know what to do. I thought, oh my gosh, I should just stop this. Obviously I need to reteach. But they were so excited, I just let it keep going. But what happened sort of changed my thinking about education yet again. The students didn't get frustrated like I thought they would. Their circuits didn't work. But what do they do? They look back at their wiring diagrams and they start problem solving and troubleshooting. And suddenly these eight-year-old kids are teaching me about the engineering design process right in front of my eyes. They had planned, they had designed, they had executed. It didn't work. They're going back. They're replanning, they're redesigning, they're changing. As these projects continued, I started having a lot more faith in the wisdom of children and realizing that their perseverance was incredible if given an opportunity to showcase it. So as I continued with these projects, I learned some other things along the way. I learned you have to keep them as open-ended as possible because the same challenge can have very, very different results. I also learned don't give very many rules 
And finally, show them no models at all, nothing to copy. I'm going to show you two very short video clips with my students doing the same task, and you'll see how they approached it differently. The challenge with this, they had to develop a ball launching system that is going to launch a ping pong ball and land in a bucket. Okay? We even ended up with this coordinate grid on the floor so we could measure how far these balls were traveling and firing from different coordinates, which was pretty interesting. The first clip I want to show you, though, I want you to look to the right of the screen. You're going to see a big white arrow, and this little boy is going to fire off his ping pong ball. <laughs> Makes me laugh every time I see that. <laughs> it's amazing what you can do with spoons and rubber bands, honestly. It had a retractable rapid fire arm. I still have no clue how he built it. No clue. The next one I'm going to show you, though, this is the same task. Look at the top of the screen with the little girl under the white arrow. She's up on the chair here. And this little girl, she developed a counterbalance system. And when this thing was all done, she had a locking pin that would lock on the chair. She could pull the locking pin, and this counterweight would flip, and the ball would land in that bucket every single time. And I said to her, how did you come up with that idea? And she goes, I don't know. I just thought of it. <laughs> That's a sign of true ingenuity. And she's eight. Now, what does it look like, though, when the kids fail? What does it look like? I did a challenge where I had the kids develop these paddle wheel boats. I had three, three rules. Your boat has to float. It has to make it from one end of my water track to the next. And it has to run under rubber band power, whatever that means. So you'll notice in this little clip here, I've got a couple of really good prototypes, little boy and little girl, both having really impressive results. This little guy with the striped shirt, he puts his boat in, and it instantly sinks. He grabs it. He shoves it to the end of the water track. He celebrates. <laughs> Look at his face. Is that a face of failure? No way. This is a child who realizes, OK, I have to go redesign. He's not done by that at all, because the students knew how to persevere. Sometimes these collaborative opportunities that I would give to the kids would really enhance their thinking, too. This is a challenge where I asked the kids to develop a marble roller coaster. My rules were simple. The balls had to roll down a track that you make in a controlled manner, and the whole thing has to fit on a piece of poster board so I can fit them in my classroom. <laughs> Now, this group of girls, they elected to make theirs entirely out of paper. This is all out of paper, with the exception of one plastic cup. That means the structure, the track, everything. So you can imagine not only a lot of paper, but a lot of tape. Now, once the kids had this finished, you think they're going to be satisfied, sense of accomplishment. No way. They don't want to be done. Mr. Stevenson, can we add another track? We have this idea we can do this loop, and it can jump. Out. The ball can jump from one track to the next. They're starting to think about trajectory and momentum. And they're asking, can we stay in at recess? Can we stay after school? Can we come in early? And I'm saying, go home. Go outside. I have papers to grade. <laughs> but the fact is, they were so committed to this problem that even after school, they're still going home and grappling with it. It's amazing. Now, not only did I see some amazing perseverance develop in my students, I also realized that the kids really had a good sense of what opportunities they could choose to pursue as adults in STEM if they chose to. The little girl on the left one day said to me, Mr. Stevenson, I want to be a chemical engineer when I grow up. And I said, oh, that's wonderful. What would you like to do? And her answer really indicated to me, she knew exactly what chemical engineering is all about because she said, I want to design makeup. <laughs> <laughs> she was sincere. She was accurate. Now. I, I like to believe that children naturally think outside the box. And it's really up to adults to help cultivate that. We do it at home. We do it at school. We do it in the community. And when we think about the future, we're going to need some really good problem solvers, really good problem solvers. In fact, there's even a global race to try to increase the number of people who aspire to STEM fields because of the innovation and needs that that await us. So it really, it's all of our responsibilities to help kids learn to persevere and, and solve problems. But what can we do? As parents, and I, I'm a parent of two wonderful children, we want to provide open-ended challenges for the kids. I like to provide lots of recyclable materials. Look what this kid did with a box. It's amazing. If you give them opportunities like this to build and create, 
they're being ingenious and innovative and creative. Take kids to hands-on science museums and let them explore. Or you can do like what my dad did for me and give them an old radio that doesn't work, snip off the plug, and take it apart together just to see what's inside. Educators have a unique opportunity too. As we think about trying to integrate our content when we teach, we not only increase the depth of understanding, we also free up instructional time so we can embed amazing projects and STEM challenges right into our daily instruction. It's daunting, but if you start slow, researching online, finding some projects, looking at the next generation science standards that were released last year that have some really good suggestions in there, partnering with field scientists to come into the classroom to make it come to life and make it relevant, and above all, believe that your children are going to be a genius. Now, the business community has a stake in this as well. By developing partnerships with schools, we can do employee mentorship and volunteer programs. Having professionals come in and talk to the kids about career options is wonderful. And of course, no one is ever going to deny financial contributions or consumable contributions. I mean, tape alone, we go through a lot of that. We also have to think about decision makers and policy makers at the state level, state boards of education. They have a unique opportunity to adopt standards like the Next Generation Science Standards that came out last year. So far, eight states have adopted them. But it really places uh, a level of importance on STEM education in the classroom, which I think is profoundly significant. Together, if we work together, we can actually preserve, protect, foster children's natural desire to discover and invent. And for that next little Albert out there, he will also learn how to persevere and innovate. My final thought that I'm gonna leave with you, it's a challenge really. I'm gonna challenge you each to try something today. I'd like you to try to make a table that is 16 inches tall. It has to be made of nothing else but newspaper and tape. It has to be sturdy enough to hold at least 10 pounds of books. Difficult challenge, perhaps. But don't worry, if you have trouble, just ask a child to help you and keep experimenting. Thank you very much. Britta, that was excellent. Hi, just give me a quick second. Sorry, I'm like clicking, 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 clicking. Um, so <clears throat> let me just bring up the next slide here. Make sure I've got all of this. Um, well, my slides. OK, there we go. So um, I think there's quite a few uh, takeaways uh, from, from that uh, video clip. Uh, sorry about the quality of the streaming, uh, but hopefully you, you caught most of it. Um, I, I think my key takeaway from that is that we really do need to reframe our thinking regarding failure. It's all about perseverance and trying as many solutions as you can to find the one that works best. Um, it's be, it's not it's about not being afraid to take a chance or take risks about trying. Um, so it's something that I think is going to really sit with me moving forward. Um, I really appreciate uh, that perspective uh, from, from this video. And uh, anyone who wants to take on the challenge, and challenge from Mr. Stevenson, uh, you get to present your homemade table out of newspaper and tape that can hold up to 10 pounds of books. Um, at our next session. All right, um, the next video, um, and this one is a little shorter, but um, a little bit more animated, um, a, a very dynamic speaker, um, Miss Stephanie Hill, who is the uh, executive vice president for RMS for Lockheed Martin. And Miss Hill tells the story of the accidental engineer and why the United States cannot afford any more accidental engineers. So let me try this again. Let's hope this works. And if not, we'll um, 
We'll uh, get this going. Hold on. Ah, doesn't like it again. OK, hold on. Um, I promise next time I will get all the kinks worked out if I have to do one of these again. Um, You're doing great, Britta. You're doing great. This is that video was amazing. Well, I think you'll like this one even better. So let's get it up if I can and go in there. And there we go. Let me know if you can hear it. Can you all hear it? Thumbs up. Yes, sounded good. I call myself an accidental engineer. If you had asked me when I was in middle school or high school or maybe even the early years of college, if I would grow up to be an engineer, I would have looked at you like you had three heads. I didn't know any engineers growing up. I didn't know what engineering was. And at that time, STEM was not even an acronym. I can remember starting at Lockheed Martin around all these amazingly smart engineers and having so many of them say to me, I always knew I was going to be an engineer. I knew I was going to be an engineer from the time I was this tall because they had someone in their life who was an engineer, maybe their father, maybe uh, an uncle or, or a neighbor. That wasn't my story. My parents were very well educated and I knew a lot of professional people, but none of them were engineers. In fact, when I told my daddy, that after college, I was going to pursue a career in engineer. He asked me if I was going to work on a train. <laughs> and I was like, no, Dad. <laughs> I was really good at math and science growing up. Math was my favorite subject, and I knew that I wanted to do something with it for my career. So I knew some accountants, and I knew that accounting was a good career, and that you had to be good at math to be an accountant. So I said, I'm going to be an accountant. I enrolled at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, as an economics major, I was going to get a certificate in engineering and later go on to be a certified public accountant. And then in my sophomore year of college, I took an elective as all uh, college students have to. And I took an elective in COBOL programming. And I, yeah, COBOL, I know it was a long time ago. And, <laughs> and by the way, I was the last of the group that used those punch cards. So, you know, I really understand. Oh, some of you were there too. I appreciate rubber bands, you know. <laughs> I absolutely fell in love with it. It transformed me. I was almost like Peter Parker getting bitten by that radioactive spider, except it was a computer science bug for me and it grabbed a hold. And I'm going to tell you to this day, it hasn't let go. It changed the course of my life. Now, I don't know how much you know about my alma mater, but we are the UMBC Retrievers. And our mascot's name is True Grit. And that is no accident. If you had been in some of my classes, my math or science or even my accounting classes, you would know you needed True Grit to get through those courses. My professors were challenging, yet they prepared me to be the very best software engineer that I could possibly be. And when I started working at Lockheed Martin 30 years ago as a software engineer, I it opened my mind to working on systems that save people's lives, that protect our nation and our world. But I will tell you that when I was in middle school, when I was in high school, when I was in college, I had no idea how rewarding, how much fun, what a difference you could make if you chose a career in STEM. So I am extraordinarily passionate about helping as many of our young people as possible to gain an interest, to maintain an interest, and ultimately to pursue a career in engineering because we can't afford any more accidental engineers. We have a frightening shortage of young people who are interested in science, technology, engineering, and math in this country. And one of the reasons I think that they're not interested, that they're not clamoring to go into this amazing field, is because they also don't know how rewarding, how much fun, and what a difference you can make in this amazing career. So I think we all have to shout it from the rooftops. STEM is an awesome career. We've got to tell everybody that we can. We've got to tell our stories. We've got to make STEM come alive for our young people. And if you don't have a story, you can tell mine. 
<laughs> minorities, and in particular, underrepresented minorities, are the fastest growing part of the population in this country today. Yet, we are the least likely to obtain a degree in engineering. And this has to change. In order for it to change, it will take all of us using our collective superpowers to be the difference. So I'm going to start us off right now, and I'm going to shout from every rooftop that I can that if I had not taken that course in COBOL programming, if I had not been blessed enough to get a job as a software engineer at Lockheed Martin, I would never have had the privilege of shepherding the creation of scientific marvels, of impossible innovations, technologies that are used in land, air, sea, and space. I can remember when I first started at Lockheed Martin, I really didn't talk to my family and friends much about what I did at work. I mean, I was writing code, and I didn't actually know how to translate that to someone who wasn't a computer scientist. But then in 2008, there was a rogue satellite. Some of you might, if you all remember the COBOL and punch cards, you will remember this. 2008, there was a rogue satellite falling from the sky. And there was a great concern that the fuel tank on that satellite, when it made contact with Earth, would cause significant catastrophic results for a large part of the world. Well, I wrote code for the launcher that shot that satellite out of the sky and saved us all. <laughs> and, I, <laughs> and so when I, when I got home that day from work, I was like, Mom, Dad, that's what I do. <laughs> and they were like, wow, that's really, really cool. I really felt like I had superpowers then. For me, the excitement of engineering is the excitement of solving problems. It's the excitement of creating something that didn't exist before. It's the excitement of creating technologies and solutions that help us all to do more, to be more, to achieve more. And even with the awesome possibilities that a career in engineering can unlock, our nation still has a critical challenge. We do not have enough people majoring in science, technology, engineering, and math. And our nation's demographics are changing. We need people from all backgrounds to fill the talent pipeline so that we can make sure that we unlock tomorrow's undiscovered superpowers. And me, I have to tell you, I get to do some really cool stuff. Lockheed Martin does exciting things. We do revolutionary things. We do things that some people think only happen in the movies or in graphic novels. And I'm going to tell you about just a couple of them. This F-35 helmet gives our F-35 pilots, pilots real superpowers. You're talking 360 degree vision. You're like Wonder Woman flying around in her invisible plane because you can. that pilot can actually see through the structure of the F-35 jet using six embedded super high cameras to be able to feed his helmet. You're like Iron Man soaring through the sky. You know how Iron Man has his helmet on and he's getting all kinds of information, airspeed, altitude warnings. Well, in the F-35 pilot, that helmet, he's getting all of that information and more, helping him to more effectively execute his mission, keeping him alert and keeping him safe. Human machine teaming at its finest. Now, what's the primary job of a superhero? Save lives. Well, our next technology is a lifesaver. This is KMAX. KMAX is an unmanned aerial vehicle, and it is a lifesaver and it's a potential game changer. What you're going to see here on the screen is a demo of us using four of our autonomous capabilities to fight fires and to save people. There's a stranded hiker in this scenario. And we're going to do all of this without putting any human, additional human life at risk, not a pilot, not a firefighter. So first we use something called Indigo. It's a quadcopter that has an infrared camera that will find a hot spot of the fire. Then we launch a desert hawk that goes off to find where the hiker is, locate them, send the coordinates for that hiker to another unmanned helicopter, deploy that rescue helicopter, save that hiker, and at the same time, KMAX, which was initially designed to be a cargo lift transport helicopter, is collecting water and taking that water back to the fire, right to the hot spot that Indigo found to very effectively put out that fire. All this is happening 
and this can happen in the real world all this is happening while not one additional life is being put at risk and it's all controlled all four of those autonomous vehicles are controlled by a simple ipad interface now i could stand here all day and tell you about the amazing technologies that i am privileged to work on and i would love doing that but i'm not going to do that because that's not my point my point is is that if i hadn't gotten bitten by that computer science bug early on in my college career i would probably have never been able to be a part of working on solutions that can literally save the world. My story isn't unique, but I surely hope that it can be inspiring so that we can all really believe that if we expose our young people to the marvel of STEM, to the excitement of STEM, as early as we can, far earlier than I was, that we will have more of our young people pursuing careers in STEM. I am living proof, and we can't afford any more accidental engineers. Now, I know that a lot of folks are saying we hear STEM all the time. STEM is everywhere. And as much as we talk about it, that ought to be sufficient. I'm here to tell you it's not. There are communities in our country who may have heard of STEM. They may know engineers. Yet when they look in the mirror, they don't believe it's for them. By second grade in 2017, there are young girls, many young girls, who are already deciding whether or not they're good at math. Second grade. In second grade, you shouldn't be deciding that you're not good at anything. We have to speak life into our young people. We have to help them to know that they can achieve anything that they want to achieve, any aspiration, if they're willing to work hard at it. But it will take absolutely all of us to do that. We have to all use our collective superpowers. We've got to get together like the Avengers, using all of our innate abilities to encourage as many of us as our young people as we can to see possibilities beyond their current view, to speak life into them, to ignite their passion for STEM. And this has to keep going, not just from second grade, but all the way through. I met a young woman who was a senior in an engineering school, an African-American woman, and she said to me, I'm thinking about not pursuing a career in STEM anymore. And I asked her why. And she said, when I first started as a freshman, there were many women in my class, and now I'm the only one. And the young men in my class don't, let me participate in their study groups or their activities that help them to be better prepared. She felt isolated. She felt alone. I'm here to tell you, do not be discouraged. Diversity drives innovation. Diversity is a virtue in engineering. We need so many voices at the table to make the impossible possible to bring superpowers to life. We need many different ideas, many different views. We need a million different answers to the question, what if? All right, can you guys hear me again? Yep, we can. All right, so, um, oops, wait. You've all been in a bar, oh, right? Hold on. <laughs> but let me good. stop Have that. Have you ever gone to a bar? I didn't want to show you any more. <laughs> <laughs> Technology. I'm, I'm getting the hang of it slowly but surely. Anyway, let, let me let me go back to my slide. Um, so as Ms. Hill said, um, talking about STEM is not enough. Uh, we have to do all that we can to um, encourage STEM education uh, throughout school, throughout the school system, uh, starting the kids at an early age, encouraging them to explore, to learn, um, and to have fun with, with the various um, disciplines. Uh, some interesting facts about the STEM education that reinforce several of Ms. Hill's statements. Um, according to a survey uh, from last year, sorry, a study, it shows that 92% of boys and 97% of girls are going to lose interest in STEM if they're not immersed before fifth grade. So think about the numbers of boys and girls that we're losing every single year if they haven't been um, actively engaged in a STEM program and what that means for the future of our workforce and the future of the innovation security and the economy um, of our country. 
And in the United States, there are more employment opportunities for skilled scientists than there are applicants to fill them. So keep that in mind. So what can we do besides uh, verbally say that we promote and support STEM? Well, regardless of whether you have children in school or grandchildren uh, whom you see on a regular basis or nieces and nephews uh, that you mentor and, and support, uh, there are a lot of things that we can do to support both as individuals and as a post uh, the STEM programs in our region. Uh, you can coordinate with your regional DODIA schools and reach out uh, to, to other schools in, in the area to see how we can support them. Um, what are their needs? Do they need supplies? Um, are there special materials that are needed uh, to support, um, as stock the classrooms and support those programs? Um, can we join the outreach community as an individual and look for other creative ideas? Uh, can you join the camps community? You know, be a mentor at a future SAME, uh, SAME camp. Participate in job fairs um, in the local high schools or even job fairs for, for young soldiers uh, and airmen who are getting out of the military. Um, encourage them to go back to school or to take in an apprenticeship somewhere that will bring them into the STEM world and continue to promote STEM to your family, friends and neighbors. Talk it up. And how do we inspire and support STEM interests in our kids or your neighbor's kids if you don't have any of your own? Well, you can think of fun and engaging ways to teach STEM topics. Um, for example, talk about gravity when you see a child tossing a ball in the air. You can discuss fractions or percentages when you slice a pie, whether that's a, you know, a baked good or a pizza pie. You can cook uh, with your kids or, or your grandkids and provide them with opportunities to talk about measurement, boiling and evaporation. Toys and vehicles that you give kids give them a chance to learn about pulleys, levers and engines. Find out which hobbies you or your partner and or your children or grandchildren or your neighbor's kids um, have that are rooted in STEM subjects and use them as a platform to promote, teach and inspire. So I happened to Google STEM board games because because I found that recommendation out there and Amazon alone came up with over 4000 results for STEM game boards, um, board games for children of all ages. Uh, there's a lot of apps out there as well, since we know that most kids these days, if they don't have a phone, they definitely have um, an iPad or something similar. You can foster out of the box thinking by assigning creative tasks at home. You can encourage collaboration, problem solving, creativity, and of course, communication. Introduce project based learning by having your children or grandchildren work on a real world challenge. And most importantly, teach by example and embrace mistakes as they help us all, including our students, learn and grow. So I want to leave you uh, with this quote um, and a couple of additional um, notes. One, uh, this year's National STEM STEAM Day is on 8th of November. So think about how you can support and promote STEM or STEAM, um, including the arts in, in the overall program um, on that day and any day, but especially that day. If you have children or grandchildren, uh, nieces, nephews, neighbors, kids, be sure to encourage them on that day to get curious about math and science activities. Um, and most importantly, um, encourage and support anybody that you come across that expresses an interest in STEM. Um, I think this is really important to, to keep in mind um, as you go about your day-to-day -day activities. Um, it's the little things that sometimes can make a difference. Um, so I'll share a quick little story with you. Uh, back in fifth grade, um, I was in a Department of Defense school um, over here in, in Germany, and um, I wasn't a bad student. I was actually a pretty good student, um, but one area that I did struggle in was in math class. Now, mind you, this is fifth grade math, 
And um, I don't even remember what we were talking about in math that day, but I will never forget the teacher who said this to me and exactly what he said, because it stayed with me throughout my life. Um, I was having a little bit of a hard time understanding the topic. And so I called him over and asked him to walk me through it one more time, the explanation of what we were doing and why. And do you know this man had the audacity to say to me, it's okay, don't worry about it. Everybody knows girls aren't good in math anyway. That devastated me. I never told my parents what he said. Um, I never responded back to him. I just hung my head and never asked another question again. Uh, that statement to me stayed with me throughout my academic career. Uh, every time I had a math class that I had to take and I didn't do as well as you know I would have thought I could have, um, I just reminded myself, it's okay. Girls are bad at math anyway. And if I would have had somebody to encourage me, to tell me that I can do it, uh, to have fun with it, um, maybe I would have chosen a different career path, maybe not. But uh, I definitely would have gone through my academic career with a little bit more confidence um, and a little bit more enjoyment. So with that, let me stop and uh, say thank you for hanging out with me today, uh, for sitting through those two videos. Um, I hope you enjoyed them. There were some good takeaways and that you go out and share what you know and inspire young minds. Britta, that was fantastic. Thank you very much. You know, um, regardless of what that teacher said, you obviously are a very talented and intelligent person for putting this presentation together the way you did. And I can speak for all of the SAME members. We're grateful for your commitment and dedication and hard work and stepping in when others might be too busy to make a presentation like this and, and just very, very thought provoking. Um, and then one thought just based on your anecdote there at the end, it's not always what we what we do uh, that makes a difference, but sometimes it's what we don't do. Uh, and sometimes not saying something is just as important as saying something um, and not always saying the first thing that comes to your mind or or whatever. Um, and also really have a, in a, a tremendous influence on on the future of an individual. But uh, regardless of that bad experience that you had, Britta, it's it's obvious uh, that you just have so much to offer and we're really grateful to have you part of our community. So thank thank you for that and thank you for today's presentation and following through and being so responsive uh, to the needs of our, our community and to our posts. So thank you for that. And uh, Scott, I will turn it over to you to wrap up the meeting. Okay, yeah, th thanks everyone. Um, I think the key point I, I took away from that is yeah, 80% of the jobs will require the, the STEM skills in the next decade. And yeah, not only is there a gap, which we probably would have guessed, but yeah, we're last in the G7. So as all being in this industry, yeah, we certainly have a responsibility um, <laughs> to our own Western nation alliances, you know, our countries to, to fill that competence um, and to improve that. So I know it's something far out and far out for some of us and, and some of us that, that don't have children, but yeah, from, from our professional responsibility, it's a role and I'm, I'm motivated myself to, to, to do more. Um, so I hope this post can, yeah, maybe connect me and others who are interested in doing more to actually playing a more active role other than the, you know, the scholarships and, and, and type events that we have. So yeah, so I guess, yeah, the children, they need to be immersed in it in the school, as you said, in the, in the family, yeah, in the community. So yeah, we can fill that community role. Um, so thanks, Britta. Um, it's it's good to to learn that and and to yeah <laughs> have that motivation. Um, so thanks for that. Thanks everyone for your interest. And uh, I will stay online if anyone wants to talk to me just about um, yeah the post or yeah what we can do uh, for you in the upcoming meetings or months. Bye. Thanks, Scott.